I've been a registered land surveyor since I was 17 years old. This is my second submission to Booze and Booze. I submitted my last encounter on a whim, and after seeing all the cool comments, I had to submit another for the desert episode. Most of my surveying has been done in the great state of Arizona, for those who haven't heard my last submission. The setting is the same. It was in the early 90s, something like 30 miles south of the city limits. There was very little in the way of population out here, except for some scattered farms and dairy facilities. Traffic was non-existent too, unless encountering a ranch truck or random hiker or bicyclist. I was on the job site by about 5 a.m. I had base camp set up and was starting the first leg of the property. This job was a massive subdivision being turned into a commercial plaza on one side and a huge residential development on the other. This was a project that would take multiple days at a huge payout, so I wasn't really in a rush to get it done like normal. I even used my truck to navigate some of the more open terrain between property corners. As the day went on, the terrain got more and more rugged. I came upon this isolated lot that was honestly in the middle of nowhere. Decided to park there and get the last of the GPS shots on foot. I figured the lot was used for a trailhead nearby, or maybe the infamous Phoenix bicyclist that liked to ride through the desert. Whatever the case, I locked up my truck and went about my merry business. That business involved loading up all of my usual equipment, including the GPS rod, sledgehammer, hatchet, pistol, all that good stuff. By this point, the sun was high, but since it was a little later in the year, it wasn't as hot, maybe 90 degrees at the most. That's fairly typical summer weather for most people, but for an outdoor laborer in Arizona, 90 degrees ain't shit. Still, I had a good sweat going as I climbed up the last hillside. As I crested it and started working my way down, I could hear something. I don't know what, honestly, it sounded like a party or something. Not the most uncommon thing out in the desert. Lots of folks in Phoenix like to dirt bike, shoot, drink, all that outdoorsy stuff. Since this was the 90s, it wasn't out of question to just drive out a little of the city and do your own thing. Even to this day, lots of off-roaders can be down running the terrain outside of Fountain Hills and New River. If you know where to go, you can even shoot still. So that's what I chalked it up to. Just a random powwow, some here out within my vicinity. I got to the bottom of the hill, dialed in another property GPS shot, and continued onward. It was mostly just rolling badlands, not a lot of plant life. I could see some indigo sage and a few cactuses off in the direction that I was headed. I'd come up on that razor underbrush and had to fight for every step I took. As I walked on, the sounds got louder though. It sounded like cheering, arguing, and just yelling in general. I focused on it as I navigated the path through the bushes, trying not to cut my arms and legs up too bad, or get my equipment hung up on the branches. It was a weird distraction, as I was trying to piece together exactly what this secret event might actually be. I came upon a wash that cut through the area, so I climbed down into the dry sandy bed and used that as my path. It wasn't overgrown, and it seemed to lead in the direction that I was trying to go to. It also had the clearest avenue of sound for whoever was around me. Now that I was in the wash, it sounded like maybe they were too. I kept bucking up the wash until I came upon a bend, and now I could really hear what was going on. Thrashing, barking, screaming, cheering. They were just around the corner, maybe 50 yards or so in front of me. I knew that I was going to scare the hell out of them the moment I spilled out of the wash, so I slowed down and listened a little. It still didn't help. I couldn't tell what the hell they were doing. It sounded like a war zone but a party at the same time. Slowly, I creep around the bend with one hand tucked behind my back, next to the Glock 45 that I was carrying. I had the 32 in my boot, like normal, but decided to carry the Glock today because it was new. I just recently bought it, so I wanted to sport it around a little. Thank God I did, because if I had to reach for that 32, the people that I stumbled upon probably would have killed me. I turned the corner and saw a large group of people standing in a circle, maybe 30 or 40 in total. I remember all the cars parked next to in the lot, 
there were only four or five of them. Either of these people were really packed in together, or some of them got out here by different means, dropped off, took a taxi, or maybe even walked. It gave me a weird, nauseous feeling. Like I said in my other story, there's just something jarring about finding people where there shouldn't be any. Something had their attention in the middle of the circle. Most of them kept their backs to me. Some of them waved money around in the air. I only took a few more steps and tried to hug the wall of the wash. The creek bed got deep here where the wash turned and gave this group of people a little nook to hide in that had a natural wall around part of it. The other side opened up into a dusty field, giving the crowd more room. Didn't end up being a good call. Suddenly, someone up above me is hollering out and he's doing it in Spanish. Now I know whatever this is probably isn't good. I look up and make eye contact with the Mexican fellow, no older than 20. He's got binoculars around his neck and a pistol in his waistband. The sounds of the crowd cut off. I look down to find them all staring right at me. Now I could see what they were looking at, a little pit with a fence around it, and two dogs inside, absolutely murdering one another. I stumbled upon an illegal dog fighting arena, and their lookout had just spotted me. The issue was that this lookout was clearly meant to spot people coming up the road, and then the path. He didn't expect some dumb surveyor to come bustling through the Badlands. Now that I understood what was going on, I did what my dad taught me to do. Draw first. I yanked that big black Glock from my waistband and pointed it right at the guy up above me. I asked him if he spoke English. He nodded. I told him to take his gun out of his pocket and drop it down to me. I've never seen anyone follow directions so well. The gun landed in the sand right at my feet and I turned the barrel on the crowd still staring at me. They were caught off guard in the moment and I just happened to act first. I'm out here on the clock. There's no way in hell I'm getting killed on the job. At the end of the day, I've got a family to go home to, a wife and kids. I think it was my equipment that had the lookout in shock. Hearing my GPS rod, the thing looks like a wizard staff to someone that isn't familiar with my equipment. I had hammers and hatchets hanging from my belt. It probably looked like I stepped out from a different era when he saw me, and instead of alerting the crowd, he just watched me until I got right underneath him. The dogfight was brutal. The animals obviously had no idea that I showed up, probably didn't care. They just kept killing each other. I couldn't look for long. There was too much blood and gore. I've been a dog guy my whole life, so seeing that really put a bad taste in my mouth. There was a part of me that wanted to waste the whole crowd right there in the moment. I didn't have enough bullets and honestly, I'm sure many of them had firearms of their own. They didn't draw because I had already had the barrel on them. They also probably thought I was a cop as I wore a pretty high and tight haircut back then. I suspected they all figured they were surrounded and about to get raided. It was a melting pot of faces. Latinos, white guys, a few black guys too, all men, not a single woman to be seen. Behind them, where the wash turned into a dusty field, were the pens. Probably something like two dozen dogs, all waiting to be forced into that pit. German Shepherds Akita, Mastiffs, mixed mutts that looked pure evil, and a lot of pit bulls. The reality of the situation dawned on me, and I made short work of my goodbye. The more time I spend here, the more likely it was to turn fatal. Even then, I'd only been present for about a half a minute, and I could see them getting agitated, concerned, dangerous. I hollered out, Do not move. This is Maricopa County. We took a wrong turn, just doing a simple survey. We're backing out, and insist you do not follow us. It was a complete bluff but these were armed criminals deep in the remote desert. I backed down the wash, barrel out, until I couldn't see them anymore. All I could hear was the yipping and barking of all those caged dogs. Now that I was going the opposite direction, I could see tons of boot marks tracing up and down that wash. I was a little shocked that I hadn't noticed all the foot traffic on the way in, 
I figured I was too caught up with the noises that I was hearing. To say I was huffing it is an understatement. I'm sweating, bucking all my equipment as quickly as I could, constantly looking over my shoulder for people coming after me. Usually I'm on the lookout for rattlesnakes and scorpions. Now I was looking for armed dog fighters. That occurred to me on my escape. These assholes could literally open a couple of those dog pens and have me caught in five minutes. I might be able to stay ahead of the humans, especially with my ability to trek cross country through some serious bullshit, but there was no way that I could outrun those dogs. They were pissed off and starving, desperate for a meal. I kept that Glock trained every time I took a gander behind me, high and low, for either beast or man. I got pretty careless on my flight as the severity really settled over my head. It was sheer dumb luck that I wasn't getting hogtied and left for dead somewhere out here, or worse yet, simply fed to the dogs before a match. These guys probably had drugs, on top of piles of cash and guns, and I now knew their exact location. I realized letting me get away would be a stupid thing for them to do, so maybe it wouldn't happen. That only strengthened my resolve to get the hell out of Dodge though. I no longer had any consideration for my skin or clothes, so the sage, cactus, and desert foliage absolutely eviscerated me. I didn't care though. I knew I was moving through terrain no one would even consider trying. No one except a stupid mangy dog. They never came though, and I never heard anything. At this point, I was pretty off course, but I used the local hillside and other terrain features to guide myself back to my truck. With any luck, I beat them back to the parking lot before they popped my tires and left me stranded. I found another creek bed and I figured it would intersect with that first wash that I found the dog fighting in. I checked my watch and saw that it had been about 20 minutes and I was starting to hear some hollering off in the distance. It was a good distance behind me but I needed to get on course if I wanted to stay ahead. I took off all the stuff that I was wearing, bundled it up and tucked it inside a sandstone feature along the creek. I didn't risk my GPS rod, instead just broke it down so it was about half the size and slung it with the rope over my back. It was the most expensive piece of equipment that I was carrying. I climbed out of the creek and started along a flathead, only to almost fall into a big dark hole in the ground. It was nestled into an embankment so it was partially blocked from my initial view. I stopped turned and rerouted to get by it when the smell hit me. A totally vile rot in the air. I look down into the hole and what do I find? A den of dog carcasses, all mauled from that fight. It was the disposal pit that they dug into the ground. It only took me one look to start busting my ass back into gear. At this point, I get oriented and start cutting across the last stretch of plateau where I believe the parking lot is waiting for me at the bottom. Lo and behold, I stumble up onto the ridge to get a peek. I'm breathless, torn and bleeding, clutching my gun so hard that my hand aches. I get an eye down the ridge and sure enough, there's two kids doing laps around my truck. When I say kids, I mean 20 years old or so. One of them even looked like the lookout that spotted me back at the dogfighting ring. He leans in takes a long look inside my cab of my truck, and for some reason, that really just pissed me off. Getting run off from a job wasn't my style, but it was happening to me anyway. And not just some crazy hobo showing up, but a real organized danger. I imagined getting thrown into the pit with those carcasses and drowning in the flesh. I put the Glock in the air, fired two shots. Pretty irresponsible but it was my go-to option. I was hoping it would scare him off so I didn't have to risk a firefight. I peeked back over the ridge and all I could see was asses and elbows pumping into the desert. I hollered something else, more of the bluff that I ran with earlier, that Maricopa County was in pursuit, blah, blah, blah. That wasn't the case at all. I barreled down the hill so fast that my boots slid out from under me and I tumbled end over end the last 15 feet. I got to the truck, fired it up, and flew back to base camp like my life depended on it. 
had a car phone with me that I used periodically for work. Once I got back to base, I used it to call my brother who at the time was an undercover detective for the city. I told him about what happened to me, where I was and that I needed someone on site now. I didn't even hang up the phone before I heard sirens chirping down interstate. My brother at the front of the charge. It wasn't anywhere near his beat, but it was his day off and wanted to make sure that I didn't get jammed up for discharging a firearm. They all arrived just as I finished packing up my equipment. So I made a statement and then actually drew them a map to where the exact location was. I already had aerial maps of the area for the job, so I used a red pen to trace the wash that I followed. I can tell you today that I finished the job and made it out alive and got to hear the first-hand details of the dogfighting bust the sheriff's department made. Lots of scary things out in the desert to find, but a crime ring goes down as one of the most horrific for me. The investigators told me that the large crowd around the dogfighting ring was likely unarmed, as criminals have rules with gambling and holding guns. The only armed people allowed were employees, like the lookouts and bookies. If you were betting, partaking in drugs or alcohol, or had a dog, you probably couldn't carry a gun, per the arena rules. That's why they didn't draw on me when I spilled out of that wash. If you're a desert rat like me, always pay attention to what's around you. And if you must, have a lie ready for whoever you stumble upon. I hope you guys enjoyed this wild slice of what the desert was like outside of Phoenix in the 90s. I worked for the National Forest Service all over the general southwest from California to Texas and experienced what I would consider every lethal contact possible within the desert. My job would send me to all kinds of different terrain, from badlands to forest, where I'd have to take samples or observe some random phenomena. So I'm alone, or with a limited team, usually out in the middle of nowhere. The time of day can vary, anywhere from early morning to after dusk. There's no quick way back to civilization. If anything happens on the job, I need to react quickly and accordingly to whatever is at hand. Top tier of the list, weirdos. I cannot tell you how jarring it is to find a person where you aren't expecting there to be anyone at all. This isn't the most common encounter for me working in the forest service, but it's always the creepiest. Coming across drug addicts, drunks, homeless people, and folks that just seem off, wrong, like you caught them doing something they shouldn't be doing. They all react differently. Some want to get away as quickly as possible. Others want to talk your damn ear off. They pretend to be friendly. They try to be scary. Or maybe that just comes off naturally, I'm not sure. My reaction is always the same though. Hey, I'm a federal employee and people know where I am right now. In fact, I'm on the job, so if you leave me alone, I won't make this a problem for you. Now get the hell away from me. Not very cordial, but you can't predict people. I'm not getting murdered while wearing a Forest Service uniform. Next, the terrain, which is easiest to describe. Rugged desert, especially in regions with ravines and slot canyons. It's all that takes to kill you. No water, heavy sun, it can get to you. It happens in the superstitions and Death Valley every few years. Take a tumble on some shale, one slip or slide and it can send you falling 100 feet in some places. The fall itself might not kill you right away either. It might take a day or two to bleed out or just starve. And of course, the critters. Rattlesnakes. Gila monsters. One bite and it could kill you. Or at least mess you up enough to get lost or maybe immobilized. Tough way to go. Coyotes, mountain lions, javelinas, Mexican gray wolves, even black bears will make a trip into the desert. None of these things are friendly to encounter. Now these are the obvious ones. My stories involve two of the weirdest, most unbelievable dangers I've ever encountered. On one job, me and another guy got tasked with taking grass samples along some mesa in New Mexico. I was new to the department and eager to get familiar with the area, having just transferred in from Utah. 
The terrain was somewhat comparable, but New Mexico just had that old charm. Lots of history, lots of cool artifacts, not so much tourism. We get out there and start setting up. Taking samples is less technical than it sounds, really just involved pulling random tufts from grid squares and then relaying the data back. It's tedious because I had to be done in every direction for about 100 yards. We get about halfway through the job when we decide to break for lunch. This isn't a pressing task or anything, it doesn't even need to be finished today, but we're ahead of schedule and want to keep it that way. We decided to take our cooler and hike up a little slope that had some rocks at the top. It'd give us a great view of the area while we ate lunch. Sure enough, it is a perfect little spot. We break everything open, say cheers, and soak in the local terrain. I could see all kinds of brown, yellow, and deep red pastels in the mesas around us. It's absolutely breathtaking, reminiscent of Sedona if you've ever been. As we're lounging up there, after maybe 30 minutes, we hear this sound in the distance. No clue what it is, though. I chalk it up to dirt bikes at first, maybe a Razor UTV. It's deep, but it's far away. We don't give it much thought as we pack up and head back down to the truck. As we're walking down the slope, that sound is getting closer and doing so very rapidly. It's like they're speeding right toward our position. We start to have a little bit more concerned thoughts now, like maybe criminal activity, maybe even illegal border crossing or cartel presence. The truck itself is close, so we start huffing it to make contact with the station. Before we can even blink, a black cloud comes into view and cuts us off from the truck. It's the source of the noise and it's loud as hell. The buzzing of what we were told was 20,000 bees. It was like watching an ink blot move or a spot of oil contort itself in the air. When it rippled, the sun would catch it. The sight literally turned my stomach. I don't mind bugs, but seeing so many move around as one was disgusting to me. We didn't really know what to do, so we started running back up the slope toward the rocks. It was the only place that had any cover, but even then, if they started to sting us, it'd be over. Fortunately for us, the swarm kept on moving. When we saw they had no interest in us, we turned around for a second time and ran straight for the truck and jumped inside and sealed ourselves within. For whatever reason, probably adrenaline dump or just pure shock, me and the other guy just burst out laughing. I mean uncontrollable belly laughing, red-faced and breathless. The bees drifted off until we couldn't hear or see them. It took a long time, as you can imagine. When we relayed what happened to us, they said that swarms have to relocate sometimes, particularly after heavy rains. They also said that they were probably carpenter bees, may have been harmless. Still, it was a close encounter like I'd never experienced. Another time I was inland in California, I was working alone when the wind kicked up and created this wild dust storm. It went from relatively calm to like that scene in The Mummy, literally just a wall of dirt and sand chasing each other around. I had some various equipment set up, some of it pretty delicate, and needed to get back to the truck before it got damaged. As I'm doing this, I'm getting absolutely blasted in the face and eyes with all kinds of debris. I can't see, can hardly breathe, and it feels like this is never going to end. The way it just came out of nowhere kind of freaked me out, so I was scrambling more than I had to. I got everything sealed away and loaded up, then jumped into the truck myself. All I can do is dust myself off and try to get the dirt out of my mouth. It was a slow, annoying recovery, greatly aided by the help of my water bottle. I was just happy to be working on this one alone. No being embarrassed. No having to make small talk about whatever just happened. I just got irritated by myself. Then I hear it. Some kind of metallic clinking. At first I can't really place it. But then I realize I must have left some piece of equipment exposed. Now a wire or coupling is blowing around. Smacking into the truck. Just as I'm getting ready to open up the door and inspect the back. I see something in the side rearview mirror. It's flashy and big coming right for me. I watch in complete disbelief as an 8x8 sheet of corrugated metal coming cartwheeling right by the truck, right where I was standing a moment before, and right where I would have been had I opened up the door. This thing is thin, sharp, 
and spinning along around 40 miles per hour. It came so close that it sheared off the mirror that I was just looking in. I had to make a report to the department, who then had to file a claim on my behalf. The whole thing was insane to retell, and frankly, people loved to hear it. That piece of metal kept windmilling into the distance, totally uninterrupted by my rearview mirror. It probably cartwheeled for another mile or two before something would have been able to stop it, like a big rock or something. If it hit an animal of any kind, they'd be dead on contact. Lots of wild stuff happened in the desert, and those are two that not many can tell. Be careful, always pack water, and above else, tell someone where you're going. Around 15 years ago, I was living in Las Vegas with my then boyfriend at the time. We'd originally moved there from California for a dual opportunity for both of us. My boyfriend Blake got hired to work for a towing and roadside assistance company. I was going to take advantage of an out-of-state tuition program the college implemented to recruit students. I was essentially getting a prorated discount so my tuition would be the same as a Nevada resident. We gave it our all. But this plan really never came to fruition. We were young and wild, really drawn to the Vegas scene, parties, and nightlife in general. We got into an apartment and Blake lost his job pretty much right away, to many late nights drinking, using drugs, walking the strip, and missing shifts that were at any time of the day. I flunked out right around the same time and took on a pretty good amount of debt. To say we were set back from the start was an understatement, shot in the foot so to speak. The issue was that shot in the metaphor wasn't a bullet, but heroin of any variety. Blake got hooked really bad, and I was in more to stimulants like cocaine, but used with him if nothing else was around. It was far worse than I'm making it sound, and life for us was very difficult. Making the bills each month, keeping fit, all the normal stuff. With our addiction and incessant need to party every night, these were simply unobtainable. Electricity and water in our home became a myth for about eight months. Living in the dark, tweaked out, careless. It was miserable to say the least. We lived like that for almost a year and a half, just barely scraping by. Blake would work odd jobs, but honestly, he was probably just stealing and ripping people off, maybe even begging. I did some dog walking, cleaned parking lots up for small businesses, jobs that would make me $20 here and there. Nothing that would pay a bill, just enough to stay high. Things started to get more real as time went on. Threats of eviction, police wellness checks from people that knew us, just your average results of being a junkie. With the financial noose around our throats and real financial and possible legal consequences were about to come our way. We were kids, but knew our situation could honestly get worse if we ended up going to jail. After a month or two of talking, We decided to get clean and get back on track, which is much easier said than done, but we knew that we were out of options. Honestly, getting that messed up was never part of the plan. When we moved to Vegas, we were drinkers and partiers, minor drug users, but slipped into full-on addiction territory. The idea of getting clean overlapped with the idea of returning to our old identity. By this logic, Blake wanted to spend some time doing the things that we used to do, long walks, nature photography, live music, all kinds of outdoor recreation. We were big kayakers before we moved to Vegas, even bicycled, but had lost touch with every hobby that we ever had, short of shooting death into our veins. So that became our plan. We spent a couple of weeks drying out, cleaning the house, selling some stuff, and getting our feet back underneath us. It was a hard, dreary process, but it needed to be done. While this went on, Blake was acquiring random camping gear and assembling a second phase to our plan. After drying out and losing the shakes, he wanted to go out into the wilderness and camp for a weekend, fill his soul with natural beauty, and find a piece of his old self. I was totally on board with everything, as I was desperate to have something of my old life back. We planned this trip poorly and found ourselves leaving town the next Friday. Blake did zero research as for where to go just started following the stretch that would take us out of town. 
We were originally from Idaho, so we were used to pretty wide open, even rugged wilderness. We failed to realize that most of the recreational area around Vegas is rolling desert. We pressed on undeterred. There were signs for lakes, canyons, national and state parks, all kinds of stuff. We were confident that we would find something reminiscent of a forest. We never did. A couple of hours go by. We both feel the urge to go use, to go back to the city. Start to feel the panic of never finding a destination. Blake gets off the interstate, starts following winding dirt roads towards very distant mountain ranges. He's blathering on and on about how there has to be something. There can't be nothing. There just can't be. He was starting to lose it, and we hadn't even spent the night away from home yet. As he continues to get us deeper and deeper into the desert, I'm starting to panic too. He follows one dirt road off the interstate, and then a splinter road off of that one, then a splinter road off of that one. We're in a beater of an SUV that isn't really cut out for all-terrain driving. We're also on track to be completely lost if we follow any more of these offshoots. I'm afraid of expressing any of this to Blake for fear of turning his panic and frustration onto me. Silently, I let him create a harrowing situation for us. This was a huge mistake, because after another 20 minutes of offshoots, the car begins to sputter. Blake looks down, his eyes bug out. The car is out of gas, and we're so far from Vegas that we wouldn't even know what direction to start walking in. He does everything in his power to remain cool, keep it together. He just says this is how it's supposed to be. Let's spend a couple of nights around here, enjoy the night sky, have a campfire, get our minds right. For where we're at in our head, that was a pretty tall order. Blake limps the car into a little clearing, partially framed by low brush and one single tree. There's a dry creek or a goalie of some kind beyond that, and then rolling desert hills for what looked like miles and miles. We were finally alone, out in the middle of nowhere, with nothing but nature to tempt us. Everything from start to finish was a disaster. As we started to set up camp, the tent that Blake brought only had half of its poles. We had to use bungee cords and whatever random string that we could find to tie it up to a tree for support. The back half was flat and not very usable as the ceiling and wall wouldn't stay up. We went to dig a fire pit and found that we had no shovel. With a couple of stones, we bored out this tiny pit. The dry desert was not easy to chisel away. Once we got it all lined with stones, we set about gathering firewood, only to realize that we didn't have an axe either. We collected all the twigs and branches that we could find, a few decent logs, and piled it up. The next few hours were the only decent part of the trip, and almost served to help me forget about all the itches inside my head. We lounged on a big blanket and watched the sun go down, then got the fire going. We talked about all kinds of stuff that we hadn't talked about since we moved. It was the closest thing to normal that I felt in a while. We broke into the food, had a couple of snacks, then got roasting over the fire. Two cans of beans, potato chips. It was simple, but with how much we used drugs, food was a rarity sometimes. Eating like that underneath the stars was hugely nostalgic. Only after we started eating, that we realized that we already burned through almost all the wood that we gathered. We were treated into our tent as the temperatures started to drop without the sun. That late in the year, it was probably 35 or 40 degrees out there. But guess what? Blake didn't bring sleeping bags. He brought a small set of blankets and then the big one that we were sitting on the dirt in. I watched in horror as he dragged it through the rocks and brush right into our sleeping area. We huddled together for warmth under the dirtiest blankets you can imagine and prayed for the sun to rise. If there was anything that made us want to use, it was being stuck out in the cold. All I wanted to do was pass out, but I knew it would never come. After a completely sleepless night, we finally ventured back out around sunrise. The sky was beautiful, just enough for us to pick around in the cold and gather up some more twigs. We turned the ashes back into coals and warmed up and talked a little. I mentioned coffee, to which Blake said that he brought some, which almost brought me to tears. When he came back, he looked mortified. 
He said he brought the grounds and filters, but didn't have anything to make it in. We brainstormed for a while, but didn't really come up with anything. I finally gave up and just said I wanted to eat breakfast. Blake went back into the car and came back with two shiny cans, more beans. I laughed and asked him what else he got. Again, he looked nervous and said that was it, literally. He brought four cans of beans and a bag of chips for us to survive over an entire weekend. I was shocked at the point of screaming. This was going from bad to worse. I explained that maybe we weren't ready for this kind of trip. Maybe we should go back home. He sternly reminded me the car was stuck and out of gas. How could I forget? I started pouring sweat after he said that, half nervous from being stranded and half from withdrawals. My guts were twisted up, my eyes hurt, and I could feel phantom track marks in my skin. I was craving bad. So was Blake. He just wouldn't admit it. He started saying weird stuff again, started grinding his teeth a bit. There wasn't anything to do short of a walk back to Vegas, and I wasn't desperate enough for that yet. Of course, we didn't have cell phones, being junkies and totally broke. That was something we hadn't been able to afford for six months. We were stuck like popcorn in your teeth. The tree that we set up under seemed to be the only one for miles. I found tiny strips here and there, but nothing worth picking up. I worked up a sweat with the hike and was starving by the afternoon. I was also craving drugs like no addict would believe. Walking to Vegas started to sound fine. Next, I tried to find a little high ground. There was one hill far off that seemed to offer a little vantage point, but I walked toward it for an hour and never really got any closer. It was much further than I thought it was, further enhanced by my withdrawals. I could barely tell up from down and the sunlight was literally killing me. Still, these were my only options. I gave up on the hill and started walking toward the roadway that I could see. It had tire marks from cars, dirt bikes, and all kinds of outdoor recreation. I had a little hope that someone might find us before it got any worse. I started walking in the direction of our camp. I slogged for what felt like miles and miles as I went. Nothing felt familiar. I knew I was a little off course, but I figured there would be something to clue me into my direction, but there was nothing. The desert is a cruel keeper for those that venture into it unprepared. I walked into the sunset and then well into the dark. Soon I saw a flickering fire off in the distance. It was in the direction that I'd been instinctually walking. Sure enough, as I closed in the last quarter mile or so, I could see the faint outline of the car and tent. Then far off on the ridge, I saw some headlights for just a moment. There were actually other people out here. Hope flared up inside me again. It took me forever to get back to camp, and when I got close, I could hear something. It was Blake. He was talking to himself, out loud, full volume, carrying on and on. I sped up, hoping that maybe I could catch him before he spiraled out and totally lost it. But as I did, I heard something even weirder. There was a second voice. Someone was talking back. I corrected myself, slowed my pace to a crawl. I didn't want them to hear me just in case whoever he was talking to wasn't friendly. It was easy enough to not make noise since I was mostly walking in sand. I crept up to where the bush started before the tree, careful not to step into the firelight. Blake had a pretty good fire going and a small pile of logs next to it. Where the hell could he have found those? I'd looked literally everywhere. Blake had his back to me as he stood on the far side of the fire. He was facing the darkness upright and rigid, but relatively normal looking. I couldn't see who he was speaking to, but I could hear them. They were going back and forth about where I'd gone, and Blake promising that I'd return soon. That he'd get me all comfortable, and then the stranger could take me. I was already cold from the temps and the withdrawals, but I felt true ice go up my spine. Take me. My paranoid mind created a scenario where Blake was taking me out to the desert to exchange me for money or drugs or something else. A million things are racing through my mind and my heart is steadily catching up to match the speed. Everything is worse and crazier than I ever imagined. I let myself get dragged right into it too. Slowly, but panicked, 
I started picking my way through the desert and away from camp. I looked back and saw Blake still facing the dark, but in front of him, I thought I saw something standing there. Something tall, slender, totally creepy. To this day, I just chalk it up to a hallucination from the panic attack that I was having, mixed with the withdrawals. The weird part was that Blake was talking to something out there, so it would have had to been a shared hallucination. Either way, I started jogging once I got out of earshot. I cried most of the night chasing phantom headlights that I would see along the low hills and stretches of desert. I don't know how long I ran for, but I wasn't in great shape as you can imagine. I walked after that, cast long looks behind me into the darkness. I kept expecting Blake or the thing from earlier, but neither appeared. I walked until dawn and actually saw some people in jeeps off in the distance. They were rock crawling, thank God, which meant they were pretty average dudes. They took one look at me and drove me right back to the city. They insisted on taking me to the hospital or the police station. I just asked them to drop me off near the neighborhood that we lived in. I didn't tell them what happened, just that I'd been abandoned out there and they really didn't press the issue. They gave me their phone number just in case I needed a statement from them or anything, but I dropped it on the street the moment that I got out of that car. The more distance for me and the memory of that trip, the better. I walked the rest of the way home only to find the car in the driveway. Blake was already home. It was unbelievable. The car had been out of gas, probably a dead battery too, as we'd been using it to listen to music to that first night. I was scared to go in, but ultimately I had to. He said, thank God, he was about to call the police, but I really don't believe that because we obviously never had a good relationship with the police. It only devolved from there. Blake said he waited all day for me to come back, and then some off-roaders came up on the campsite. They jumped the car, dumped some gas in it, and gave him solid directions how to get back to town. It was a true godsend. The only thing was, it seemed like he was lying. I explained what happened, how I came back to the camp, found him talking to himself, or someone in the dark. He got kind of flushed and swore up and down that that never happened, that there was no one else out there. Either way, I packed up my meager belongings slept on the street that night. I started taking steps to leave Blake, was in with a friend a month later, and was on my way to sobriety after that. Life's been good to me since. I never heard from Blake, although I hear he's still in Las Vegas. He never admitted to anything about what happened that night, but I still can't help but wonder. Stay clean out there, folks. This will be brief because I'm not really sure how much of this I can accurately remember. I'm not much of a writer. Thanks to Booz and Zach for helping me get this submission together. When I was a kid, my uncle would take us out to the hills along the California border and rip around on quads and dirt bikes, all kinds of cool off-road vehicles. My uncle and cousins were huge into motocross life, so they would drag me along every couple of summers to learn the ways of going fast in the middle of nowhere. Uncle Luke taught us handling, terrain shifts, jumping, wheelies, the whole nine yards. One summer, I remember being far more fascinated with the idea of exploration. My cousins were older than me, so they were allowed to compete harder tracks and bigger jumps. What I could do was pretty limited, so I liked going far and seeing what was out there. One ravine would lead into another. Sometimes I'd find water or evidence of such. Once, there was a massive spill out in the way of a waterfall. It almost took the dirt bike right over the edge because I couldn't see the terrain change in front of me. So that summer, I took one of the bikes and raced around for a bit, but then soon took to the hills. Usually, I would tell Uncle Luke that I was going to explore, but this time I didn't, and that single mistake led to this entire incident. I started tooting around the foothills until I found this path. It looked more like a game trail than a bike path. It was open enough that I could comfortably follow it, so I did just that. 
it got pretty dicey, which I thought was fun because I had to actually use some skill to get through it. It may not have been a 30 foot gap clearing, but it was my own kind of off trail milestone. I'd lost myself in the switchbacks and soon an hour or two had gone by. I knew because the sun had shifted high in the sky and I was getting hot underneath my helmet and goggles. Up ahead, I saw the trail open up into a dusty clearing and I decided I'd rest there for a minute or two. I wasn't worried about getting lost because there really was only one way to go. The bike was heavily modified by Uncle Luke, so it had a gas can attached to the rear and actually held a couple of extra gallons in the tank itself. It also had these premium tires that would make short work of any kind of terrain that I encountered. I cut out into the clearing, found a place to stop where the ground was real level, and killed the bike for a second. It felt good to not have my legs and pelvis vibrating from the constant throttling. I pulled my helmet off, ran a sleeve across my brow, and just relaxed for a minute. I even popped the kickstand and poked around the area for just a bit. There have been trips in the past where my cousin and I had found pottery, arrowheads, even hieroglyphics on sandstone outcrops. There wasn't any of that here though. What I saw was even weirder. I was sure that I was hallucinating at first, but as I watched, it didn't fade away or anything. I saw a car driving through some bushes, bouncing along a dusty ass trail I guessed they were using as a road. It wasn't just a car though, it was a long, stretched out black limo, there in the back country. I stopped and waited. I could even hear the thing driving off in the distance. I could also hear a bass, like club music or something. It faded with the car engine, so I assumed that they were one and the same. I looked back at the dirt bike and then shrugged. Curiosity got the best of me. I mean, hell, finding something weird was literally why I was out here. I jogged back over to the bike, kick-started it, and burned after the limo. As I followed its tire tracks through the sand, I told myself that I was really doing this guy a favor. He was probably using GPS, and it took him way off course or something. Now he was lost out here in the desert. It made sense in my mind, and served as a justification to track him down. Meanwhile, far behind me, Uncle Luke and my cousins have rolled out on the quickest bikes formed a little search party. I've been gone for far longer than I thought, around four hours plus, and they assumed that I was lost, stranded, or injured. There's about four and a half miles of rough badlands between us. I can hear the bass over the roar of the dirt bike now, so I know I'm close. I even start to see the glint of paint through the brush. I get a little reckless. I decide to push it and come up on them. What are they going to do, shoot me? This is isolated desert, specifically for motocross, so I'm well within my rights to drive around them if I wanted to. I come around a bush, there it is, dirty as hell, scratched as shit, idling in the rough. It's maybe 50 feet away, I can see the very back window is about halfway down. I keep cruising alongside it, trying to not make it obvious that I'm staring under my goggles. When I see a hand come in the open of the back window and wave me over. Weird, but this is honestly what I was looking for and kind of what I expected. A helpless motorist way off course. I start driving over to the window when I see a pale head pop up and eyeball me over the glass. They reminded me of Gollum. Long stringy hair, buggy eyes, total creep show. As I guide the dirt bike over to this person. The last thing I want to see comes into view. A gun. A shiny pistol. Leveled right at my chest. What are they going to do? Shoot me? Yeah. Yeah, they are. The first discharge was so jarring that it took me a few seconds to realize he actually pulled the trigger. It wasn't until I saw the smoke from the barrel and heard my ears ringing that it registered. I cut the handlebars and gunned it away from the psycho, only to hear him discharge the gun five more times. I could hear the bullets whistling around my helmet as I sped away. The limo sped away too, hauling in the other direction. It wasn't until I looked back, I saw it had Las Vegas plates. I remember the pale, mottled psycho in the back seat, 
and took a deep breath. Some druggie out here with his casino money? Something weird, but I didn't have enough info to really figure it out. All I knew was that I needed to get away from that car. Soon enough, I came across my uncle and my cousins. They were all in a panic, even worse than me. They heard the gunshots through the desert. They figured I'd been murdered by cartel members or something else. I explained that I came upon that limo and the guy riding in the back opened fire on me. Uncle Luke guided us back to camp and called the sheriff's department from there. We made a report, but not much came of it. I don't even think they went out and looked for that guy. Thank God he was a bad shot because neither me nor the bike were hit by any of those bullets. Had I gotten any closer, he probably would have splattered my brains all over the back of my helmet. Had I told my uncle which way I was going, it wouldn't have taken them so long to come and find me. You gotta be careful out there in the middle of nowhere, because it turns out anything can happen. 